Hey guys and ladies, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a perfumer's portfolio video on one of the masters actually. And it's funny because I thought I kind of hit all the big name perfumers so far, or at least that top tier, if you will. But somehow this gentleman was left out. Now I only have um, six fragrances in my collection that he uh, has signed, has penned his name to. Uh, has been the perfumer of record on, and one of them is my wife's. But of those five, one's a decant, one I'm um, hit or miss on, we'll talk about that. The other three are absolute loves, and so what he does, he does very well. His name is Mr. Carlos Benaim, and um, there's a quote that he um, said basically sums up his career. It's an old Arabic saying. Whatever is not given is lost. And he said that's how he basically tries to live his life and his career. And I like that. Um, and I'll read you a little bit about Carlos Benaim from Frederick Maul's website because Frederick Maul and Carlos Benaim have worked on three fragrances together, if I'm not mistaken. I have two of them in this list. One of them I don't have. Um, it says, Carlos Benaim is considered to be America's greatest living perfumer. He owes his success to a great intellectual curiosity that has always pushed him to embrace a world beyond the boundaries of perfume making. He discovered perfumery as a child through his father, who was a pharmacist in Morocco, and had a passion for extracting essential oils. Every summer, Carlos Benaim remembers... My father and I would drive our Jeep through the countryside in and out of uh, picking and distillation spots, and I would feel his enthusiasm intensifying. He later acquired a deep knowledge of perfume composition under the tutelage of the renowned American perfumer Ernst Schiften. And it says that over the years and through many a trial, Carlos Benaim and Frederick Mall's working relationship has developed into one of great professional intimacy. Carlos Benayim enjoyed full use of the rare freedoms and vast resources the house is able to offer, particularly in the choice of raw ingredients, and the time left for creation. Together, they composed Eau de Magnolia, Music for a While, and Dawn. Um, so, before we hop into the fragrances in my collection from master perfumer Carlos Benayim, uh, let's do Scent of the Day, and I'm going to have a, a quick thought. So, this is a fragrance that I've talked about before. It's long discontinued, and it's a fragrance that sits in a very strange spot in its place in the time it was created and the whole idea. So the fragrance itself is a Gerard Anthony, another master perfumer, and one that I want to remake his perfumer's portfolio video on. I feel like I'm going to uh, remake that video because I left out a fragrance and I feel like it's incomplete. It bugs me every time I mention it, so I'm going to remake that. Uh, and um, this fragrance is called Homme de Grey. Now, the house is Parfums Grey, which is a house that dates back uh, a long while. Um, you know, Cabochard you know, is is probably their most famous creation, I would venture to say. Do I have a bottle of Cabochard to show you? Yes, I do. Okay. So here's the bottle of Cabochard, which if you like fragrances like, you know, I would say um, Bandy by Robert P. Gay. If you like Aramis by Estee Lauder, you know, it falls into that category, I would say. I absolutely love this fragrance. Someone told me the new version is quite nice as well, but I've never smelled it. I have this older bottle. The bottle's absolutely beautiful with the bow, the simplicity of the bottle, the name on the top, uh, the house on the bottom. But anyways, I just wanted to show you the house. Um, you know, Homme de Grey is my scent of the day. Let me show you the atomizer. It's absolutely amazing too. Look at this. I don't know if you can see that. That's like a Creed atomizer. Um, and this fragrance is unique because it came out in 1996. And if you think about what was happening in 1996, 1996 was Aqua de Jo territory. So basically this fragrance said, it gave the middle finger to the establishment and said, forget what's popular. 
you know, we're just going to do whatever the hell we want to do. And I love that in a person, in a company, in an organization, you know, in a mindset, in a thought process. I just absolutely love that um, rebel mentality, if you will, the outlaws. And this fragrance did that because it is completely opposite. In fact, it pulls pieces, I would say, from 1960 fragrances like Abbey Rouge. There's a little bit of that, you know, lemony, um, swirling, bergamot, lemon opening uh, with sandalwood in the base. There are pieces of Abbey Rouge here, but what differentiates Homme de Grey is there is absolutely zero sweetness. None. If you could actually go into negative sweetness territory, this would be it. If you like bitter fragrances, this could be your holy grail. This is so bitter and dry. Dry and bitter are the two words that probably fit this fragrance best. It's so dry. It's so bitter. It lacks no sweetness. Um, there is zero sweetness in this fragrance, whereas Abbey Rouge has that Guerlain vanilla which I actually prefer wearing Abbey Rouge because it has that rosewood, which I've mentioned before. Rosewood is a note that brings me back to being a kid because my mom had these rosewood jewelry, um, rosaries from the Holy Land. And um, this is a very good fragrance, but it's very strange when you think about the time it came out. Parfums Grey basically said, throw out the playbook, do whatever you want, Gerard Anthony. Um, this does have this 60s chiffre, um, you know, if if you've smelled fragrances like Art de Capucci, Abbey Rouge, you know, it's in that kind of ballpark. There's a giant slug of oak moss, and the base tends to go spicy, so it opens up very fresh, lemony with neroli. There's a beautiful neroli note here, by the way, which is a very hard note to execute, and there's one of uh, Carlos Benaim's... Um, Creations is actually one of my favorite Neroli fragrances, and you won't believe it because it's not an expensive one. Um, there are some florals. There's a little bit of jasmine and a little bit of peach, but what you mostly get is the musk and the sandalwood and the dry down and this giant slug of smoky oak moss, okay? And the smoky oak moss will remind you of a little, a little bit of Smalto Porom. You know how it has that smoky um italian style with the oak moss in the base the freshness in the top and the smoky oak moss down below there's a little bit of that here as well but it just sits so contrary so in odds you know it's like the antagonist to the uh fresh fragrances you know it's it's a complete uh 180 it's a complete dichotomy it's something completely different to what was coming out in the 90s and, you know, even though this isn't my favorite of the style, this is an amazing fragrance. And, you know, when you can find a bottle like this, it's this is one of the advantages to really digging and diving into a uh, passion, if you will, like, like we have for the fragrance world. Diving into a passion headfirst, right? Just completely in. Um, you're not dipping your toe into the water, you're diving all the way in, you're learning all, all you can because people aren't going to hype this. There's also maybe a little bit of lavender in here, but just a touch. You know, I think they use just enough lavender for you to say there's lavender. But, you know, it's not a lavender-centric fragrance, if you will. Um, you know, but where I was going with really diving into the fragrance world and learning about different fragrances is this is not hyped, right? So, you know, some of the fragrances we'll talk about here in a minute, they're hyped fragrances. Uh, even the vintage ones I'm going to talk about go for huge money. This is one where if you wanted to get an idea of what a perfume in the in an era where there weren't restrictions, a master perfumer could do whatever the hell he wanted to do, um, you know, if he wanted to use real Mysore sandalwood, you could still do it in 1996. If he wanted to use a huge slug of oak moss, he could still do it in 1996. You know, regulations were starting to, it was just, the worm was just starting to change, but it hadn't changed yet. And Gerard Anthony, um, created this little gem 
and it got discontinued, of course. It didn't sell very well. It wasn't what was popular, and then no one hyped it. So it's not, you know, $500 a bottle. It's not insane pricing. You can pick, I think I paid $60 Canadian, which is like 50 bucks US for my bottle. Now that was, you know, a year, year and a half, maybe even two years ago from Anouge um, at Enchante. But this fragrance is, you know, kind of one of those under the sand. You got to dig a little bit to, to, you know, to find it. You got to get your shovel and dig. People aren't just showing Homme de Grey on every vintage channel. So, something to definitely check out. Um, and it's a Gerard Anthony. He doesn't make bad fragrances. Even though his late 90 fragrances, um, Roy... Le Roy Soleil from Salvador Dali is not my favorite. This is not my favorite of his creations because he did so much amazing work. Azaro Porom, Akitos, Balenciaga, you know, Porom. Um, it doesn't stack up against his real heavy hitters, but it's a Gerard Anthony, you know. And if you can find this for, like I did, 50, 60 bucks, value for money is through the roof. It's absolutely, you know... What you're getting here for the money is very hard to come by nowadays in modern perfumery. So if you're a collector of vintage, this is definitely one to keep an eye out. Okay, so that's my scent of the day, and it works beautiful in spring and summer. All right, so let's talk about um, Carlos Benaim. And he burst onto the scene in 1978, and he created what was um, one of the best masculine fragrances of all time. I mean, if you did, this is a this is a list of the greatest masculines ever created. This would be on my list, top ten masculines. This is Polo Green, or just Ralph Lauren Polo is what it's officially called, but everyone calls it Polo Green. Um, this bottle right here, the one that I'm actually currently wearing. Like, if I needed to pull juice and I wanted to wear it, this would be the one that I would use. This is actually a, um, this is a cologne spray Warner. Now, Warner was the original uh, owner and distributor for Ralph Lauren. God, the smell from the atomizer. Um, they then sold the rights to Cosmere. So I have a Warner and I have a Cosmere bottle. Okay, you can see Cosmere distributed right there. And, um, you know, as a, as a lover of different versions and, you know, distributors and hunting down the correct version, I would say try to get one of these two. You don't have to go for the Warner. The Cosmere is still, uh, all. you know, this is, either one is what you would want. The new stuff has lost a step. I won't say it hasn't. It's still a good fragrance, but it's lost a step. Um, and, you know, I was wearing a fragrance to bed last night, and I will do a comparison video between these two. I know I've said I'm going to do it for a long time, but I wore this to bed last night. Giacomo de Giacomo. This is the vintage bottle that it used to come in. By the way, people ask me, someone just asked me where is a good place to find vintage uh, if you're watching this video, mate, there it is. Enchante Perfumes in Canada. They ship worldwide. There's his little logo on the back of my bottle. Uh, it looks like a, um, it looks like a shampoo bottle or something, right? Doesn't it? Like a conditioner bottle or, uh, and this is the first version. It was then put into a bottle that kind of looked like this, but it said Giacomo de Giacomo in blue writing. Either the blue writing or this one is the one that you want to try to find um, because the modern and the vintage are like two completely different fragrances. Totally different. Not even kind of different. They are so different that if you put them in different bottles, you could trick people into thinking they're two different fragrances. And that's why I'm all about versions and distributors and all that because there is no way in... there. Not a snowball's chance in hell that you could convince me that this is just different because it doesn't have air in the bottle or, you know, that kind of stuff. You just need to give it time. No, these are completely different fragrances. Same name, but different fragrances. And the company is, they're living, 
They're living off of their name is what they're doing. They're putting a completely different reformulated fragrance in a bottle and they're calling it the same name. And, you know, while Polo Green isn't as bad of an offender of the Giacomo de Giacomo, and I'll do a comparison video, even though I don't even want to spray this on my skin. Honestly, I don't because this is so lovely. If I wear it, I just want to wear this. But I will bite the bullet and I will wear one on one hand, one on another one day and do a comparison video for you guys. Um, and that's the reason why I so heavily tout a, a specific version of a fragrance. And if you don't know Polo Green, um, I've often said that this is what a man should smell like to me. You know, someone born in the 80s, this is my impression of what a man who is put together, has his priorities in order, takes care of his family, you know, that kind of stuff should smell like. Uh, it, 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 it just, you know, you, you will stamp your authority all over people wearing this. You know, when you walk into a room, they could be wearing Roja, they could be wearing Zerzhov, they could be wearing uh, Kemi, anything you think of that's high-end niche, you will stamp your authority all over them wearing this. Um, it is, it's one of my favorite pine leather tobacco fragrances of all time, of all time. Um, the oak moss in the base, you know, oak moss just adds this pop, this, um, you know, it adds almost like ambergris adds this sparkle. Vintage oak moss added this, this weight and this depth, you know, it just, it, it, it adds something that you know, can't, it's very hard to be recreated without it. Even the synthetic stuff they're using nowadays, which is quite good. There is a synthetic alternative for oak moss, um, but they don't use it very often. It's like a style thing nowadays, I think. Um, and because of that, these kind of fragrances stand out. They stand out so much. Um, and, you know, in a world where everyone is trying to be politically correct, everything's unisex, you know, nothing is for a man or for a woman, you know, like Amouage used to have Amouage interlude man, interlude woman, they took that off, you know, and, and that, that's the world that we live in nowadays. Whether you like that or don't like that, I'm not taking a side, I'm just specifically stating that that's the world we live in. This is the ultimate form of masculinity. And I know some people say, well, I knew a girl that used to wear this, fine, whatever. You know, that's that's the one in a million case. Most people, 99.9% .9 of people that smell this will instantly think of masculinity. It just, it just oozes masculinity to me. And I just love the greenness, you know, that, that pine note is accentuated with other green notes, basil, tarragon, coriander, um, but that tobacco and leather, it's just lovely. I mean, these are the type of fragrances that when I wear, you know, when I wear them, the vintage, my heart is just, you know, stuck in the vintage world. Even though you've seen me say I love Amouage, I love Roja, you know, I love some of these niche brands, um, I've been doing first impressions on Spirit of Dubai. I've been taken with a couple of them. They're niche, you know, that kind of stuff. They're very expensive, but they're, they're niche. Um, there is something about this vintage style. And, you know, when you think about, they created this for the average man. Not many people are going to go spend $715 on a Spirit of Dubai or $1,000 on a Roja or whatever it is, right? But... Um, back then, yes, this was like a sign of success, right? If you wore polo green, you were in the upper echelon of classes back then. You know, you were in the tiered country club class, if you will. And, you know, if you couldn't afford this, though, Ralph Lauren was very sympathetic to the public. They released uh, Chaps, and I think Chaps is an amazing fragrance, but this was the one that was the... You know, this was the country club. This was the guy playing polo, playing golf. Um, are the bottles, are the logos the same? I think they are. Yeah, there's no difference in logo uh, between the Warner and the uh, Cosmere. There is a little bit of a difference in the sprayer, though. 
take a look at the of the Warner sprayer and then take a look at the Cosmere sprayer. See how this one's white? This one's actually taller too. The Warner is a little bit taller and it's a little bit thicker right here. Both of these are testers, so I don't have caps, but that little green that little green um, bit around the atomizer is different for the Warner. So anyways, Polo Green, Carlos Benayim just burst onto the scene with one of the greatest masculines. What a start to a career is the way I look at this. And that was 1978. Now, here we are, 2022. He's still making fragrances. I've got some of his fragrances we're about to get to from a year, two years, three years ago. Um... But first, we're going to jump to 2005. Now, I should mention that in between that, there were other fragrances that he came out with that were hits. He came out with Flower Bomb by Victor and Rolf, which is funny because uh, my wife just got back from hanging out with her girlfriends and she said, hey, one of my friends has this fragrance from Victor and Rolf. I really like it. It's called Flower Bomb. Uh, well, it's made from the same perfumer that... Um, that makes her signature scent, which we're about to get to, that she's been wearing lately as a signature scent anyways. Uh, she didn't know that, but I just, I knew it, and I thought that was kind of interesting. He also made uh, Armani Code Pour Femme in 2006. I never smelled, never smelled Flower Bomb, never smelled Armani Code Pour Femme. He also worked with um, Christ Christophe La Laudemiel and Bruno Jovanovic to create Abercrombie and Fitch Fierce. Um, so that was a big hit as well. And he did some other things I've never smelled. Um, he actually did Eternity for Men, which I have, I think I've smelled, but I don't have it in my collection. He did, um, Spice Bomb Infrared, which I don't have. Polo Blue in 2002, which I don't have. Luna Rosa Ocean, which I don't have. So he's done a lot of, you know, popular fragrances as well. He did the Prada for Women in 2004 and Euphoria Eau de Parfum in 2005 for Calvin Klein. So he's done a lot of other fragrances, but we're jumping from 78 all the way to 2005. And in 2005, he did this fragrance for um, the House of La Hueve, which is a which is a Spanish house. And this is a three perfumer job. Laurent Leguernec and Emilio Valera, Valeros are the two other perfumers, and this is called Solo. So it's Loewe Solo. And Loewe Solo is supposed to be this um, spicy, fresh fragrance with a Spanish twist to it. That was the idea. Um, and I actually, this is the one that he made that I own that I kind of struggle with. Um, there is an interesting lavender in here. There's a little bit of cinnamon and nutmeg and cumin, but there's an insane note of guava. And guava is a, um, South American, Span typically popular Spanish, you know, you see guava fruit juice drinks and stuff like that. And that guava note is just so strange, you know, and it's ever present. It hits me instantly and I can smell it. Uh, and it's not that I don't like it because I actually do all, you know, guava in a smoothie or something like that is amazing. But, uh, in a perfume like this, I'm not a hundred percent sure I'm on board with it yet. I like it, but I, I, it's not a love. Um, and then what they ended up doing is they ended up putting this, this is what the vintage bottle looks like, the older bottle. Uh, they ended up putting it in the standard Loewe bottles, which look like this. By the way, this is 001 Man. I like this way better than, than Solo. Um, I think this is one of the best fragrances Loewe has outside of their uh, classic, which is um, Essencia. Essencia is the Loewe classic I absolutely love. Um, but this is the new bottle that Solo comes in. In case you're looking for it, it is still available, but it's in the standard. LVMH put everything in the standard bottle now, like they did for Guerlain. Um, Lueve 001, man. That is so good. That might be their best fragrance. 
Okay, so let's go to from 2004. Solo was from 2004. Um, if I said 2005, I apologize. 2004. And we're going to jump to 2015. And he came out with a um, one of the best just standard designer fragrances that you could buy for 40 60 70 bucks. 70 uh, Sometimes you can get it for discounter as much cheaper. It didn't make my cheapy list because I think it was a little bit more expensive um, than the $40 cutoff when I checked. But it's, it's right there. It's 40 50 60 I think. This is called Dunhill's Icon in this amazing bottle. This bottle is heavy. I mean, you could curl with it. If you threw this at someone, you could knock them out. It's a heavy bottle. I love the, the presentation. This basically put Dunhill back on the map. And, you know, because they were a brand that they've been around since 34 making men's fragrances, I think. But um, they used to be a tobacco, um, a seller of fine tobaccos and cigars and stuff like that. And I feel like their fragrances were considered to be very old school. They had Dunhill Edition in 84. They had the original Dunhill for Men in 1934. And then they had Dunhill Blend 30, which I actually have coming on the way. I ordered it almost two months ago. It's coming from Italy. Hopefully it'll be here in the next week or two. But, um, even with a no by July, it took so long to get here. I should have an unboxing very soon of Dunhill Blend 30 and another surprise fragrance. Um, but Dunhill Icon is one of the best uses of Neroli that I've ever smelled in any fragrance. Uh, I love the way that he used Neroli in Icon. It has this beautiful... Um, very approachable, you know, it's kind of one of those fragrances that brings people towards you, right? You know, some of the fragrances that um, he has made are heavy and brash and in your face. This is one that still has the legs, you know, it has some oud underneath, it has some leather, vetiver, oak moss, there's a beautiful iris note here too, which I think just softens everything out, you know, gives that lovely powderiness it blends the lines it's absolutely beautiful the narrowly absolute which is a high class note by the way that's not a cheap note to use in perfumery neroli absolute with petit gras i think those come from the same plant by the way uh cardamom provincial lavender sage juniper berries and then the base of iris oud vetiver leather and oak moss this is an absolutely stunning work scent Stunning. Um, and even though you may be able to get it for cheap-ish, it's not super, you know, cheap. It's not eight, ten, twelve dollars cheap, but you can get this for a very reasonable price. Um, it it smells much higher quality than than the dollars you're paying for it, in my opinion. Uh I think Icon is absolutely amazing, and I love the scent. Um, so Dunhill's Icon. And then we're going to jump to 2018. There's two Frederick Malls that came out in 2018. One I've got a decant of. One I have a full bottle. The decant is called Dawn. Now, they wrote the Dawn. Mudasir wrote the Dawn. It's actually just called Dawn. And uh, Dawn is a resinous, smoky fragrance that supposedly uses real oud and the highest quality frankincense that money can buy is what it smells like to my nose. It's basically a, it's an oud labdanum, okay? Kind of like um, Serge Luton's La Couche du Diable. That oud labdanum combo is here. But there's also rose, Turkish rose and Turkish rose absolute. And it's, it's a rose oud with the frankincense really amped up and pushed to the front row. Okay, so think of this like a rose oud, but done in a way where the the incense, the frankincense is the star of the show, because it is. The incense and the labdanum is kind of the stars of the show. Um, but behind it all, it's a rose oud with oak moss and vetiver and a little bit of sweetness from pink pepper. Pink pepper smells a little different than black pepper, 
sometimes it has a little bit of this sweetness to it, you know? And I think you get a little bit of that sweetness from the pink pepper when you first spray. And there is supposedly real oud in Dawn, okay? So this is one where would I love to have a bottle? Absolutely. Would I pay five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars a bottle, whatever it is? I don't know that I would. Um, and that's why I think I'm working off of this decant. I probably have nine mils out of the ten left, which is enough for me for now. Um, but if you're a fan of some of the fragrances I mentioned, if you like Frederick Malls, um, you know, Middle Eastern line, if you will, Dawn is one to, to sniff, especially if you're an incense lover. The incense here is definitely of the highest quality. Definitely. Um, I have so many incense fragrances I love is the thing, though. It's, it's one of my favorite notes. Um, and so, due to the expensiveness of the bottle and the fact that, of course, money's not unlimited for me, I have to kind of prioritize, so I went with a decant, but I'm very glad to have, you know, had a chance to explore it, and I'll talk about that more on my channel soon. Once the weather turns, I'll start talking about more and more of those heavier scents. Okay, now, uh, Frederick Mall. if you watched my buddy Rich Mitch's uh, fragrance rotation video from this week, he talked about what an amazing house Frederick Mall is for summer, for some of their fragrances, and one of my favorites came out in 2018, and it's a Carlos Benaim, of course. His name is right here on the front of the bottle, and it's called Music for a While. Now, Music for a While, I think, is one of the most unique, modern, uh, fougere fragrances I've ever smelled, because at its heart is a fougere, absolutely 100% fougere fragrance, but they mixed in some notes along with the usual stuff that you expect in a fougere, so along with the lavender and the kumarin and all that good stuff, you're hit with pineapple. One of the best pineapple notes I've ever smelled. And we all talk about Pierre Bourdon's use of pine pineapple. You know, he used it multiple times in multiple fragrances. Um, he used it in that MDCI Ombre Tepeki or whatever it's called. Uh, he used it in uh, Gianfranco Ferre for men, not for man. For men from uh, 2006, he used pineapple in the in that fragrance, and then of course his student Jean Christophe Haro used it in Aventus, and so we think about pineapple in those terms. Also, pineapple was used in the 80s um, for Lapidus Porom. That was one of the one of the earlier uses of pineapple that I can think of in a masculine perfume, and it was done beautifully. But here. This pineapple is just so succulent and juicy and photorealistic. I mean, you know how pineapple has those ridges when you cut it? Uh, you can almost see and feel the ridges in the pineapple in music for a while. But then you get that classic masculine lavender, and there's a patchouli note as well. Uh, and the patchouli adds this heft. So even though this works beautifully in the summer, the patchouli the amber and the vanilla just add this heft to the fragrance and it lasts forever lasts and lasts and lasts this thing lasts all day on my skin i mean literally for a summer fragrance i like to wear this in the summer because of the fruitiness of it you know fruity fruity fragrances just don't go in the winter for me um and but this is one that is just I mean, one of the one of the true beast mode summer fragrances, if you will. Now, just as a side note, before we get to the final fragrance, there are two other Frederick Malls that I have that I absolutely love in the summer. One of them Rich Mitch talked about, which is uh, Geranium Pour Monsieur. And Geranium Pour Monsieur uh, is a Dominique Ropion who also... Um, it just came out, or I just learned it, maybe other people knew this, but I just learned that Dominique Ropion trained under Pierre Bourdon. Your Rose told me that, and um, that really was kind of a shock to me. That was kind of a, um, really took me back, but it makes sense. I mean, what a, what a legend uh, Pierre Bourdon is, and this fragrance ended up turning into Portrait of a Lady, because they took 
the idea of the of the base of this fragrance and they turned it into what ended up being Portrait of a Lady. And then they took Portrait of a Lady and turned that into a rose oud with uh, the knight. You know, it's like Portrait of a, la of a Lady with oud added. So this fragrance kind of really snowballed into something even bigger, but it's beautiful in summer. And then the other one that I absolutely love, I think I like this better than Geranium Pour Monsieur, is Rose and Queer. This fragrance is amazing. And the way that Jean-Claude Elena used the geranium here to give the impression of this rose, you know, he, he, uh, I don't think there's any rose in Rose and Queer. I think it's geranium. And, you know, he does this um, sleight of hand trick, this Jean-Claude Elena, you know, uh, Jedi mind trick on you to think that there's rose in this fragrance. I do think there's leather in here but it's not a leather fragrance. It's a green, fresh, um, but just the, the combination to me is intoxicating. It is an intoxicating fragrance and it works beautifully in the summer. He did the same trick with the geranium, by the way, just as a quick side note in uh, equipage geranium. I wore, the, I wore these two to bed one day on different hands and I was just, um, admiring the way that Jean-Claude Elena used the geranium in those two fragrances. But just as a side note, you know, these three Frederick Malls, Music for a While, Geranium Pour Monsieur, and Rose and Queer are absolutely perfect for the high heat that we're having. I mean, it, it's middle of July in Texas, you know, that's, this is the kind of stuff that you should be wearing if you're trying to be season specific and proper. Or you could do what I do and go old school. You know, go with the Homme de Grey. All right, final fragrance. And again, it's not mine. It's 2019. It's my wife's fragrance. This is her. You can see her dent that she's put in this bottle. This is YSL Libre. And Libre is marketed for women. Uh, it came out in 2019. It's this floral sweet fragrance with lots of... Um, and again, Carlos Benayim used this Neroli note again. Kind of like he used it in Dunhill's Icon, but there's no oud. Um, you know, there is lavender here, French lavender, jasmine sambac absolute, Moroccan orange blossom absolute. So he went with the neroli and orange blossom combo, which I think those come from the same tree, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. And then there's bourbon, vanilla, cedar, ambergris, and musk in the base. I like this fragrance. It smells great on my wife, um, but I would, you know, of course, I would love to see her wear stuff like Shalimar or some of the classics, Mitsuko. I mean, I, I would absolutely love that, but she likes to be modern, and so this is a modern woman's fragrance, uh, and it does what it does very well. Uh, it's just too sweet for, you know, it's not like I could wear something like this personally. I could wear Shalimar. I could wear Mitsuko, I could wear Valde Nui, all, all those kind of fragrances, Bandy, the women fragrances I love, Opium, I'd love to smell my, my wife wear Opium, but she prefers the more modern stuff. If that's you, this is one to kind of check out, otherwise I'd go for the vintage stuff. So, that's the breakdown on Carlos Benaim. Not a huge list of fragrances in my collection from him, but the ones that he has that he hit on the head, Polo Green, Dunhill, Icon, Dawn, and Music for a While are absolutely stunning. I'm still, I'm still coming to grips with Solo Lueve. That guava note is just too strange for me, but if you have experience with some of Carlos Benaim fragrances, I'd love to hear your thoughts uh, on the Master Perfumer. Um, so I would love to uh, see your faces in the comments. You know, the, um, the feedback, the you know, the interaction with you guys is what I really love. It's why I do this. I don't run this as a business. This is not a job for me. This is a this is a side passion, if you will. I won't use the word hobby. I'll say a side passion because it is a passion. Heinke's exactly right. Uh, it is a passion for me. And I, and I love every second of what I'm doing. And I do feel very blessed and honored to be in a position, you know, to have people that know fragrances probably even better than I do following me and, and watching my channel and all that good stuff. So it's a, it's a pleasure and an honor. 
and that's why I take this very seriously and I try to work hard at it in between all the other stuff I'm working hard at, like studying for my CFP and all that good stuff. So I have a lot on my plate, but I'm always trying to make time to do these videos, trying to do it daily. Sometimes it's impossible to do one every day, but I try. And so this puts the check mark on Carlos Benaim. I can't believe we left him out. So um, I will go back and redo the. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna redo the um, Gerard Anthony perfumers portfolio because I left one out and I feel terrible. And so even though that was six months ago, it I feel like it's time. It's time to do a part two and include you know the fragrances from him that I left out on part one. It's just. Um, you know, I feel like I've kind of done him a disservice and he's such a great perfumer. So anyways, that's the video. Thank you very much for watching. Do leave a comment, a like, and a subscription if you can, but if you don't feel like it, it's no big deal. I'm not going to hold your feet to the fire. Like I said, this is a community, a tribe of people that are here because we love the content. You know, we love fragrances, the art of perfumery, and um, usually interacting it with those kind of people comes very naturally. It shouldn't feel forced. Don't feel forced to leave a comment uh, because I'm asking you to. It does help the YouTube algorithm. Actually, someone just wrote me right before I started this video and said, I can't believe I just stumbled across your channel. How have I never heard of you? Those are the kind of people that I want in, in the tribe. Those are the kind of people that I want in this little community that we're building. But in order for them to find me organically, YouTube algorithm has to kind of recommend me. If people do searches or, you know, once they watch something, the next video pops up. And if you've noticed, I don't do any editing. This is one shot. I don't do any graphics. I don't do, you know, I put the names of the fragrances in the description of the video, but I don't pop them across the screen when I'm talking because I don't know how. Uh, and I don't put a music video at the top with an intro music because I don't know how. Um, so this is just pure hit the camera and start talking about fragrances in a passionate, loving, and hopefully knowledgeable way. So anyways, that's that. I don't want to drag it out any, mo any longer. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. Cheers, guys, and I'll see you again tomorrow with another video. Bye now.